All right, hello everybody. We're into our last uh, week of World War One here. We're going to hit the end of World War One. We're going to hit the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, we're going to have another one of those document assessment things, and then we're actually going to start uh, World War Two at the end of the week. I'm going to have you guys watch um, probably like a video, and then another little part of a video, uh, just to kind of wrap up the week. I'll have to try to figure out how to get those videos to you. So. We are moving in to uh, things winding down here. We kind of covered how things uh, wound up. We talked about the battles and how everything was kind of bogs down in this trench warfare. We talked about America joining. Uh, in the same year that America joins is the year that Russia has their Russian Revolution. So uh, they are, after that revolution, going to be out of the war. We talked about that way, way back uh, at the beginning of the semester. Uh, so that is when Tsar Nicholas II gets overthrown, and now you have uh, Lenin and the Bolsheviks, and Stalin's going to roll into power after Lenin. So Lenin gets that Treaty of brest uh, signed with Germany. I know I say things in Russian wrong. Don't make fun of me. I try my best. Uh, so Germany basically then gets to take like a third of Russia's territory. They get a, a bunch of uh, money from them. They give Russia really harsh terms because uh, Russia was not winning. They weren't necessarily getting annihilated, but they were not winning for sure. So they uh, kind of had to accept pretty rough terms there. Uh, this does, though, mean for Germany, they get to shift all of their forces to the Western Front. They finally get that one front war they've been looking at or looking for since the beginning of the war with the Schlieffen Plan. Uh, they were hoping for a one front war against Russia. Instead, they've beaten Russia. And now they've got a one front war against France, Britain, and good old America. So, uh, unfortunately for Germany, it's a little bit uh, too little too late. Because the problem is at this point, Europe is exhausted, and not just their troops are exhausted, but um, possibly of maybe more or at the very least equal significance, their resources, their supplies are exhausted as well. They do not have the fresh troops and the fresh resources that they need to fight. Meanwhile, America's rolling in. We haven't fought for this entire war. So our economy is looking great. In fact, we've benefited quite a bit from the war because we've been selling stuff. Uh, so we've got a great economy. We've got brand new, fresh troops. And that is enough to um, kind of push the war uh, into the other side. So we have, you know, the, the high ground. Thus our prequel memes over on the side here. Uh, World War I, notably, the reason why I mentioned resources being gone is uh, possibly greater importance at the very least equal. World War I is an industrial war. In modern industrial wars, soldiers matter. They're important. But if soldiers were the most important thing, Russia would have won on the Eastern Front because Russia had way more soldiers. But Germany was able to hold out and actually get the upper hand because their industry was way better, their technology was better, their uh, production was better, their transportation was better. So this industrial war concept is huge, and America coming in with a really strong economy, um, yeah, we're, we're uh, doing okay there. So it is definitely an overstatement to say that America won World War I for the Allies. That is not even remotely true. But we were kind of the, um, the final straw, right? We were that final push that uh, they needed to tip the balance in their favor. There's a decent chance they might have won even without us. But with us being there, uh, there was basically no chance that Germany was going to win at that point. So an armistice is signed. An armistice is not necessarily a peace agreement, but it is an agreement to stop fighting until you can sign a peace agreement. So this is officially signed between Germany and France, and that kind of puts everything on a hold. On November 11th, 1918, the war is officially going to come to an end, and we will have a uh, peace treaty, which we will talk about in our, uh, our next PowerPoint here. For the last uh, half of this PowerPoint, this uh, lecture, which is a pretty short one because we're just kind of tying up some loose ends here, I do want to talk about the Armenian Genocide, which is that thing from the activity you guys did last week. And I asked you guys to kind of look at the documents and tell me um, what happened and how and why. And I want to make sure that we kind of got the, the main ideas out of that. So I'm going to kind of give you the really bare bones rundown of this. Last week, by the way, was... Um, 
I, I always want to say like the anniversary of, but it's not like the anniversary. It was like the commemoration of uh, the Armenian genocide. So uh, it was a, a good timing to cover that topic. So Armenians, in case you couldn't figure it out from the document, they are a religious and ethnic minority that lived in the Ottoman Empire. Way, way back in the day, they actually used to be their own kingdom, the kingdom of Armenia here. Uh, you can see that they took up a pretty big chunk of uh, this area right over in here, um, and they were their own thing. But as time goes on, you know, they, they stopped being their own kingdom, but the people that made up that kingdom were still around, but now they were part of the Ottoman Empire. And that's bad because they were an ethnic minority then, and ethnic minorities throughout history tend to get... Um, in trouble you know people uh target them with violence you know like we see jewish people um over in nearby europe had the same problem going on for them but on top of that much like jewish people in europe armenians were also a religious minority the ottoman empire was a muslim empire and depending on when it was in that muslim empire sometimes they were actually very tolerant towards other religions but at the time of world war one um, not so much, and being a religious minority made them even more different from the rest of, you know, the Turks. And that is a big problem. You don't want to be more different because then you become an outsider and it's easy to target outsiders. So throughout history, um, as, you know, a religious and ethnic minority, they had been uh, mistreated. They had been kind of marginalized. And then during World War I, things boil over because Armenians didn't just exist in the Ottoman Empire. They also existed in other areas because, you know, they didn't have their own country anymore, so they kind of spread out, and there were Armenians in Russia, which means that when Russia started fighting the Ottoman Empire, because the Ottoman Empire was a central power and Russia was an allied power, there were Armenian troops in the Russian forces. And the, uh, the Ottoman Empire then, uh, especially this group called the Young Turks, then decided that, that meant that Armenians were um, traitors, they were undermining the government, they were, um, they were selling state secrets to Russia, and they needed to be punished. So they started out by removing all Armenians from the armed forces. Um, and this is a, um, a gradual process. Basically, you don't immediately just go to kill all of them. Uh, as we'll see with the Holocaust as well, when a genocide starts, it's not like it just immediately, all right, genocide time. It's bit by bit until the genocide is happening and people are just accepting it, right? So the Armenians and the armed forces are not immediately removed. What happens is they move them from uh, like the, the front fighting forces into labor battalions. Uh, so that means that you're, you're no longer on the front lines. You're not actually fighting with weapons. You're, you're digging trenches and um, you know doing all the, the manual labor. That started in 1915. As that progressed is when we start seeing them then executing recruits, um, killing people, imprisoning people. And then it spreads to the populace as a whole throughout you know 1915, um, especially towards the end of the war. Um, we start seeing a lot of anti-Armenian laws. Uh, this is the same way that the Holocaust is going to develop. Um, in fact, when, uh, when Hitler is you know, putting all this stuff into action, he actually directly references the Armenian genocide. Um, and to paraphrase slightly, he says something along the lines of who now remembers the Armenians, uh, basically pointing out that if you get away with genocide, people will forget about it because the Armenian genocide is not a, uh, a well-known genocide. It's, it's a relatively forgotten genocide. And part of that is because the Turkish government refuses to recognize it as a genocide. Um, and then their allies, like, you know, America, we have a long history of not doing a very good job of recognizing this as a genocide either. So um, anyway, they start passing anti-Armenian laws. Um, they start then um, like seizing weapons from them. So um, like there, there's really messed up stories of how they would do this. They would, for example, um, arrest all the men in a family. And then they would tell the family, look, we just arrested them because they were a potential danger. All you have to do is give up all the guns they had, and then we'll release them because they won't be a danger anymore. The problem is they didn't have any guns. 
because they were just average citizens. So there were no guns to give up. But when the families told the government that, they're like, well, that's a lie. We know you have guns. And if you don't give them up, then we're not going to release your husband or your dad or your brother or your son or what have you. So the the families then would find guns that they didn't have previously, but they would like, you know, I'll go out and buy a gun and they would surrender it to the government. And then the government would turn around and go, look, this is proof. They were stockpiling weapons. They were getting ready to overthrow us. We have to kill them all. Uh, so the government manufactured the idea of them being enemies. They then start deporting uh, the Armenians on these death marches through the desert. And what they would do is they would intentionally take like really long, circuitous, winding routes, marching people through the desert with um, really low supplies, not enough food, not enough water. And um, they would intentionally basically march these people to death. Um, and then if they got to the concentration camps they were marching them to, they would often uh, just uh, leave them there with no supplies or kill them um, and, uh, you know, normal genocide stuff. So the end result of this is um, kind of a, a range of potential deaths. It's anywhere from 800,000 to 1.5 million Armenians are, are killed by the end of 1923 because this keeps on going on even after uh World War One. it's notable to point out that like, even if we go with the lower number, right, 800,000, that is much less, like you compare it to the, the Holocaust, there's 11 million people killed in the Holocaust. Um, that's a much bigger number than 800,000. But you often with a genocide have to look proportionally. 800,000, and again, that's the, the lower estimate, is almost half of the Armenian population in... Uh, the Ottoman Empire at that time period. If we go with the higher estimate of 1.5 million, that is three quarters, that is 75% of the population that has been killed. That is a, a massively huge number. Um, so this was an absolutely devastating genocide, um, a, a really horrific event. Um, and it's, it's hard to deny that it happens when you have things like, you know, this picture right here, this is a mass grave uh, that was dug for... Um, Armenians that were executed. Um, and we have, you know, the, the primary source documents you guys looked at, where they're directly talking about it, um, to, to claim that the Armenian genocide either didn't happen, or as the Turkish government tries to claim that, like, Armenians might have been killed, like, you know, here and there, but it, it wasn't a genocide. Um, that's just irresponsible and, um, completely not factual because the Armenian genocide definitely did happen. Um, and it's a precursor to what we're going to see um, in World War II on an even larger scale targeting uh, not just Jewish people, but uh, all kinds of people that we'll talk about when we get there. So um, this is a um, just a really quick map of, you can see here, the, the red circles are deportation control centers. That's where they would basically round people up and then um, either move them to or from those areas. Uh, deportation stations, big, uh, same idea. Um, the, the black circles are deportation, concentration, and annihilation centers. So that's where people were just outright executed and killed. Um, you can see the deportation routes just going all over the place, everywhere here. Um, definitely not the most direct routes to get anywhere. Um, there are uh, escapes that happened, mostly on the eastern border here, because it's going to be much harder to escape from here all the way over there. Um, but you could definitely see the, um, the impact of this. The bigger the circle is, as you can see here, um, the, the higher the relative number of Armenians were that were killed. So we might not have exact numbers, but we could like date relatively there was more people killed here than there was here, for example. Um, so this is a, a very much a, a countrywide thing in Turkey, right? It's not just like one part of it. It's definitely concentrated in like the center and eastern part of it, but there's stuff going over in the west here as well. In the north, there's um, there's all kinds of stuff occurring here. So um, absolute tragedy, terrible uh, note to end on, but that is the end of our uh, lecture for now. We will talk about the uh, Treaty of Versailles next time. Thank you for listening.